Welcome to Aaron Menke's Cabinet of Curiosities, a production of iHeartRadio and Grim and Mild. Our world is full of the unexplainable. And if history is an open book, all of these amazing tales are right there on display, just waiting for us to explore. Welcome to the Cabinet of Curiosities. Everyone has those times when procrastination gets the best of them. We keep meaning to clean that garage or donate those clothes, but we never seem to get the chance to do it. As it turns out, this is a universal experience. Even princes put things off that they don't want to do. In 1820, Hungarian prince Nicholas Esterhazy finally made up his mind to finish something sitting on his to-do list. You see, 10 years earlier, when his court composer Joseph Haydn died, he swore that he would move the man from his modest grave in Vienna to a beautiful tomb at the Esterhazy estate. But when the body was exhumed, the prince was in for a shock. It seemed that his friend had lost his head, quite literally. Joseph Haydn's body was in the coffin with a powdered wig atop it. The skull, however, was missing. Now, if you're a classical music fan, you've probably heard of Joseph Haydn. He was born in 1732 to a poor family in Austria. Although neither of his parents had been musically trained, music was a huge part of his home life. His father taught himself to play the harp, and his mother liked to sing with their neighbors. When Joseph showed interest in music at an early age, his parents knew that he'd have no chance to learn if he stayed with them in the village. So, at the young age of just five years old, Joseph went to live with his cousin, the choir master of a larger town. As Joseph grew up, he dedicated his life to music, first as a singer in several choirs, then as a music teacher and accompanist, and finally as a composer. In 1761, when Joseph was 29 years old, the prominent Esterhazy family recruited Joseph to write music and direct their court musicians. Joseph oversaw music for the Esterhazys for the rest of his life. During his long career, he had a huge influence on classical music. He didn't invent the concept of the symphony, which is a musical piece of an orchestra with several contrasting movements, but he did make them hugely popular. He also was the first to write music for a string quartet, which usually involves two violins, a viola, and a cello. He was a close friend of Mozart and even trained Beethoven. But Joseph Strange's claim to fame came after his death. When he died in 1809, Vienna was under attack by Napoleon's French army. His patrons, the Esterhazys, wanted to bury him at their estate, but it was much too difficult to transport Joseph's body from the city. So he was buried in a local cemetery, with the idea that they would move him later after the war. When Prince Nicholas tried to do that 11 years later, that's when he first discovered that Joseph had lost his head. So why would someone take the dead composer's skull? Well, you can blame the idea of phrenology. Phrenology was a pseudoscience that assumed that the bumps on someone's skull predicted their intelligence. People believe that certain bumps on your head might mean that you were skilled in music or art or other talents. The skulls of famous musicians like Joseph Haydn might have all kinds of musical bumps and lumps. So when he died, two amateur phrenologists bribed a gravedigger to steal his head from a coffin. These men were Joseph Rosenbaum and Johann Peter. Rosenbaum had actually met Joseph Haydn many times. In fact, Joseph was friends with Rosenbaum and his opera singer wife. When Rosenbaum and Peter received Joseph's head, they quickly cleaned the skull and examined it, hoping to find some sign of Joseph's immense talent. They both claimed that he had a fully developed bump of music on his head, signaling that he was a great composer. Now, for years, Peter and Rosenbaum passed the skull back and forth between themselves. But in 1820, when Prince Nicholas realized that his friend's head had been stolen, he very quickly figured out who the thieves were. But Rosenbaum, who had the skull at the time, didn't want to give up his prized possession. So when the authorities searched Rosenbaum's house, he hid the skull in a mattress. He even had his wife lay on top of it and claim that she had her period. In this less enlightened age, that was enough to keep the male investigators away. Finally, Rosenbaum gave Prince Nicholas another skull from his collection. Prince Nicholas buried it with Joseph Haydn's grave, believing that his friend's body had finally become whole. Joseph's real skull, though, kicked around Vienna for the next few decades, passing from phrenologists to music fans. Eventually, it ended up at the Vienna Society for Friends and Music, where it often observed meetings from its perch atop a piano. 
By 1932, the Estrahazes had discovered that Joseph Haydn was buried with the wrong head, so they built a brand new tomb for the composer in Einstadt, in a church where many of his works were performed. But it wasn't until 1954, 145 years after Joseph Haydn's death, that his real skull was finally reunited with his body. Not knowing who the other skull belonged to, the Estrahazes left that one in the coffin as well, finally bringing an end to the world's longest game of hide-and-go-seek. Throughout the annals of history, there have been individuals whose lives have defied the boundaries of time and whose stories stretch across the ages. That's usually because of their remarkable accomplishments. But in the case of this story, it's because it literally spans so much time. Our story begins with an anecdote that borders on the absurd. In 1969, a French woman named Jean Calmeau entered into a unique arrangement known as an en viege, a French system in which a property is sold for a lump sum, with the buyer making monthly payments to the seller until the seller's death. In Jean's case, she sold her apartment, located in the city of Arles, to her lawyer, and he believed that he was making a long-term investment and paid a total of 918,000 francs over time. But in 1995, when the lawyer was 77 years old, he passed away. And you might be wondering why he would have entered into the agreement in the first place if he thought that his client would outlive him. But that's the thing. He had every reason to believe that he would inherit that apartment. You see, in 1995, when he passed away, Jean was 120 years old. Today, she's known to have the longest human lifespan on record. Oh, and for the curious, the lawyer's family continued making payments until Jean died two years later. In the end, the price paid was more than double the apartment's value. But this is only one part of the curious story. After all, 120 years is a long time. That is, if Jean really lived that long. Before I explain the skepticism behind her supposed lifespan, I'll tell you a little bit more about Jean's life. Jean had a husband named Fernand and a daughter named Yvonne. Fernand's family owned a dry goods store and they lived in an apartment above it. Later on in her life, Jean would tell the story of a customer who bought canvases there in 1888, an artist named Vincent Van Gogh. Jean's life was riddled with tragedy, though. In 1934, her daughter Yvonne died of tuberculosis, so she and Fernand took in their grandson, Freddie. Then in 1942, Fernand passed away. Jean and her son-in-law, Joseph, moved into an apartment together. About 20 years later, Joseph and Freddie both died from separate causes, and Jean was left all alone. Now in her late 80s, Jean distracted herself from her loneliness by staying busy and active. People in town often spotted her running errands, moving swiftly throughout the city streets. When she was close to 100, the mayor even commented that she looked 20 years younger. Some say that she even still rode a bike. In the early 1990s, at the age of 116, Jean earned the title of oldest person alive. Researchers validated Jean's age by observing and interviewing her. And finally, on August 4th of 1997, Jean passed away. But her story doesn't even end there. In 2018, a geriatrician and a mathematician, two men from Moscow who met on Facebook of all places, teamed up to disprove Jean's title as the oldest person to have ever lived. The geriatrician examined some photos of Jean and believed that when she was supposed to have been 110, she looked more like 90. We know that when she was alive, the mayor of her city also said that she looked 20 years younger than she claimed to be. The mathematician first used statistics to rule out the probability that a person could reach the age of 120. Then, as he scraped the internet for information about Jean, he found discrepancies in many of her stories and the reports about her life. One example was that Jean apparently told mixed versions of that story about Van Gogh. Sometimes she said her father helped him. Other times she said her husband Fernand did. She also said that Fernand introduced her to Van Gogh as his wife. However, in 1888, when this encounter supposedly occurred, Jean and Fernand weren't even married yet. This made the mathematician even more suspicious, and he started using Photoshop to tinker with Jean's features. This was how he developed the theory that, for 60 years, the woman who called herself Jean Calmo was actually her daughter, Yvonne. He believed that in 1934, when Yvonne supposedly died, it was really Jean who had passed away, but the family claimed the body belonged to Yvonne. 
He thought that maybe they did this so that Yvonne could avoid paying taxes on her inheritance from her mother. In his eyes, this explained why Jean would have lived with her son-in-law, who, in this theory, would have been her husband. It also would have meant that Yvonne entered into that agreement with her lawyer for the apartment, knowing that he would never get it. Since these two men conducted their investigation, other scientists and researchers have also published work debunking Jean's record-breaking age, but the topic has caused controversy between them and the researchers who originally validated her age. Online sleuths and fanatics have entered the chat, and a 2020 New Yorker article dove deep into each side. But even if Jean can't claim the longest lifespan, she might qualify for other titles like Best Fraud or Worst Person to Purchase an Apartment From. Whatever the case, her story shows that even when we encounter amazing mysteries, there's always someone on Facebook willing to tell you how wrong you are. I hope you've enjoyed today's guided tour of the Cabinet of Curiosities. Subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts or learn more about the show by visiting curiositiespodcast.com. This show was created by me, Aaron Mankey, in partnership with How Stuff Works. I make another award-winning show called Lore, which is a podcast, book series, and television show. And you can learn all about it over at theworldoflore.com. And until next time, stay curious. Thank you.